I really enjoyed Devil May Cry. It was a really fun hack and slash with an amazing soundtrack and a cool ass protagonist in Dante. This game was released in 2001 and you would expect with the success of a game that a sequel would be released shortly after, but it weirdly took Capcom four years to release another DMC game. And then they called it Devil May Cry 3. Must have been like when Apples and Windows skipped 9. Maybe it's considered unlucky at Capcom or something? Who knows? Devil May Cry 3 was released in 2005, the same year as RE4 and the original God of War. So I'm pretty hyped up as we all know how much I just love both of those games. It boasts many improvements over the first game with more weapons, more new characters, styles, and the game is a prequel to all of Devil May Cry. Which in fairness is only two games so far. Showing us a much younger and somehow cockier Dante. He just gives no shits whatsoever for the things going on around him and I love it. My feelings on this game are however a bit less positive than how I feel about Dante himself and given this game's reputation as best in the series, I was pretty disappointed by what I found. What do you mean you were disappointed? The Imperial Academy? What are you doing here? First off, I'm not going to keep calling you that for the whole video, and two, this isn't a Star Wars video so f fuck off. Well, the Devil May Cry series is one of my other guilty pleasures and since you're talking about it here on your YouTube channel, I thought I'd invite myself in to help you review it. Fuck. The game actually starts off pretty interesting as we are retold the legend of Sparta by another disembodied voice like the first game. But we get a little more added on about the sons of Sparta. We see the two sparring and Dante is stabbed through the stomach and he falls to the ground. We cut from this to a shop as Dante shows off what makes him so fucking cool. Sorry, not open for business yet. Some guy comes into the shop and Dante doesn't take him seriously at all before his table is flipped over and the guy disappears. Before we can even process what just happened, Dante is stabbed multiple times by a few of this game's common enemies. This seems to be a running problem for Dante. Maybe you should invest in some fucking armor or something, you know? Dante does some more cool flips and shit before we finally take control. Before we start though, we have to make a choice. Our style. There are four different fighting styles Dante can equip in this game. These offer different gameplay benefits tailored towards different styles of play. There's Swordmaster, Trickster, Royal Guard, and Gunslinger. Swordmaster allows you to expand your moveset when using melee weapons, allowing for more interesting combo opportunities. Trickster gives you a more effective dodge. Gunslinger is just Swordmaster, but for your guns. And finally, Royal Guard, which is considered the hardest to master of all four styles. You can block enemy attacks to build a meter, which charges harder hitting attacks, but mistiming your blocks can leave Dante very open. These styles can be changed at the starter levels or at divinity statues and not in between at any time, which is a real misstep since chaining together styles would have been a really cool idea. And it was, when the developers later used it in DMC4. Dante also unlocks two extra styles throughout the game, Quicksilver and Doppelganger. Quicksilver allows Dante to slow down time at the snap of his fingers and Doppelganger lets him create a shadow clone of himself. So the styles are a bit more in depth than what Ross has just explained because clearly he can't really be bothered so let me. Also check out my YouTube channel if you're interested in Star Wars content that is. Swordmaster increases the versatility of Rebellion along with the variety of other weapons that Dante can attain throughout the game. This allows him to chain more combos and easily manoeuvre around the enemies and get them into the air through the press of the circle button which can help to single out enemies and take the pressure off of him during combat. Gunslinger allows Dante to point his guns in specific directions and also spin in the air while firing downwards, allowing you to keep the enemies in the air and further damage them with sufficient use of your melee weapon of choice. It also grants other unique attacks for the other ranged weapons within Dante's arsenal. Trickster allows Dante to manoeuvre around the fight and teleport close to enemies, allowing him to get in close escape and dodge any devastating attacks. Extremely useful when it comes to keeping Dante on the move, Trickster is very much a must use when chaining combos. Royal Guard allows Dante to make himself invincible at the press of a button, 
Timing the button press at the moment before the enemy hits you allows Dante to counter and fill up his royal gauge for special attacks. Doppelganger allows Dante to clone a spectral copy of himself to assist in battle and attack enemies from different directions, diversifying his attack range and adding extra damage from extra directions, which is great for crowd control. Finally, Quicksilver lets you slow down time and allows Dante to easily manoeuvre around enemies, allowing time for extra damage and acting as a potential escape for tricky situations that you may find yourself in. The game also introduces us to a few new faces. This is the first time we see Virgil properly and not as Nilo Angelo. He's a classic example of character inversion. Take the main character, invert the colours and change the hair. Dante's hair is shorter length and down so Virgil slicks his back. It's something that's been done in media for years for clones, evil versions of characters, or like Virgil, a foil to a hero. We are also introduced to Lady, who has by far one of the most badass cutscenes in the game. I really like her design. She's the best DMC girl. I prefer Kyrie. Shut up. The game structure is broken down the same way as the first game into linear level by level progression. Occasionally I feel it disrupts the flow of the game as the split between missions often doesn't convey any passage of time but merely carries on immediately from where the last left off. So I would argue that some of them are pointless and simply interrupt the pacing. I also felt that some of the levels lasted just a little too long for my liking. The pace to me was all over the place, as one second I'd be slicing my way through hordes of enemies on my way to beat a boss, and next I'd be wandering for 10 minutes trying to find the next objective. It completely killed my enjoyment sometimes, as I would be left dumbfounded as to where to go next, with nothing to point me in the right direction, so I had to look it up before continuing along my way. My favourite sections of the game were the first few levels where we wander through the destroyed city, and the last few levels when we make our way to hell to fight Arkham. Aside from these sections, I enjoyed the boss fights, as they were all very mechanically engaging and really tested my skill, especially Virgil. His fights are just something fucking else. Every time I fought him, I was on the edge of my seat, as I couldn't overwhelm him with blows like I did the others, since he would block, parry, and counter them. The boss fights were probably the biggest highlight of the game. Nivan and Beowulf were the most annoying to me personally due to their attack patterns, especially Nivan with the stupid kiss that killed me in one shot. The other bosses were pretty good though. The lady fight is an interesting one as she doesn't fight you head on, but manoeuvres around the arena, drops grenades, and shoots at you since she isn't a hand-to-hand -hand fighter. Cerberus was a good first encounter with some easy to read attacks and no fancy gotcha mechanics. Agni and Rudra put a good spin on things by having to fight two opponents at once. Garyon was pretty easy once I got his patterns since they don't really change over the course of the fight. Arkham at the end wasn't very challenging, once again easy patterns and he didn't actually do much. However, Virgil was the total opposite of this. You fight him multiple times throughout the game and Virgil continues to evolve as you do. He gains new attacks, he uses Devil Trigger, he even for one fight gains Beowulf and can attack you with that as well. He also uses Yamato to strike you from a distance. He is by far the most intense boss in the game and is amazing because of it. Speaking of Beowulf, Dante in this game can unlock new weapons and just like the first game, I barely touched them. 
Cerberus is the coolest by far with an awesome intro cutscene and a pretty interesting moveset and the others I didn't actually use. There's Agni and Rudra which are two swords, Nivan which is a guitar and Beowulf which is similar to Ifrit in the first game but without the fire. As with the first game I didn't actually touch the extra weapons as I prefer to use Rebellion and the same goes for the firearms. Ebony and Ivory are just too good to give up and they also have the least drawbacks to using them so I stuck with them for my whole playthrough. The game looks pretty good for a PS2 title with some seriously incredible looking areas. The top of the tower being one of my favourites along with the room you fight Cerberus in. Very pretty. So the story of DMC3 is an interesting one. For myself and most Devil May Cry fans it sits at the pinnacle of DMC storytelling, being regarded as one of the best by most that enjoy the series as a whole. It's big, bombastic and really does not take itself seriously for the most part, being a game that's not afraid to show its more comedic and light-hearted side, but balances it out with some sombre moments, especially during the confrontations of both Dante and Virgil. To summarise, Devil May Cry 3 Dante's Awakening follows the story of, well, Dante in the very early days of his demon hunting shop, which he hasn't found a name for yet. Eventually, after meeting Arkham and kicking some demon ass, Dante then heads on outside, only to find that an enormous structure, known as the Temini Gru, has erupted out of the ground in Dante's home city, thanks to Virgil and Arkham, and I hope you like heights, because this is where the rest of the game takes place. Dante then scales the tower, meeting Lady, Jester, Arkham, and of course, Virgil. At the first confrontation between the two, Virgil comes out on top, impaling Dante with the Rebellion and activating his Devil Trigger. And then Dante runs down the side of the Tem in the Gru and then gets eaten by Leviathan, the giant demon whale circling the tower. Dante then escapes Leviathan descending down the Tem in the Gru in pursuit of Arkham and Virgil who want to reopen a portal to the Underworld in order to obtain the Force Edge which is just a Sparta but in disguise eventually it all culminates in the second confrontation between the two brothers with Jester revealed to be Arkham and Lady revealed to be the descendant of the priestess Sparta used to seal off the Underworld. Arkham then obtains the Force Edge aka Sparta giving him the ultimate power. The rest of the game basically follows Dante climbing all the way back up the tower and teaming up with Virgil to defeat Arkham. Jackpot. But not before turning back against each other for the final fight of the game. And let me tell you something, that final Virgil fight, even on normal difficulty, is... something else. I thought the story was alright, certainly interesting, but for me the pacing of the game kinda threw the story off a little. The actual plot and lines are well written. Well. Mostly. And now, my soul is saying it wants to stop you! <laughs> I really enjoyed the development of Dante's character from cocky dick to cocky dick who fights to save humanity. Lady also gets some decent character growth with her and Dante learning to trust one another. Also, she straight up murders her dad, which he did kind of deserve. Virgil is a great opposing force to Dante, the two of them come from the same place with the same powers and the same traumas, yet take very different outlooks on life and themselves. Virgil is obsessed with living up to Sparta's legacy and becoming powerful, whereas Dante is quite happy to say fuck that and do his own thing, living up to his father's legacy in a different, more selfless way. You know, now that you mention the big man himself, maybe the real Sparta was the friends we made along the- Wait. And that's all I have to say about DMC3. While most consider this the best in the series, due to the mostly structural issues I have with how the game guides you through its levels, its pacing, and many of the puzzle designs, I find myself massively disappointed by it. I still enjoy the story and the characters, but I probably won't be revisiting this as much as DMC 1 or 4, which I will hold off on saying anything about for now unless I wish to spoil a future video. But that's all the time I have today, and I shall see you in the next video. Goodbye.